So well, welcome to this uh, webinar about uh, the basics of adaptive optics. Um, can uh, anybody um, hear me? Can you please uh, just chat a bit to confirm that uh, everything is okay? Okay, thank you. So, uh, my name is Julien Charton. Uh, I am in charge of uh, technology and science at Alpao. Uh, so let's start with the uh, outline of this webinar. So the first, first part, of course, is to understand uh, why do we need adaptive optics and then how it works. We'll uh, review um, the basics of the main uh, components um, and the main uh, uh, setup to uh, do adaptive optics. Then we'll go with some uh, uh, real life examples. As you may know, there are now many different kinds of applications of adaptive optics. And as it is a tutorial for uh, the, about the basics, we'll review uh, a few common mistakes to, uh, to avoid. The, the idea really is to, to help uh, everybody to start and uh, quickly and to, uh, to get results as, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, and uh, we'll also um, see a few advice about uh, the best way to, uh, to, to start where, when you are really uh, a beginning in, the, in this new field. Um, so, uh, I will interrupt a few, a few times uh, the, the talk uh, to, to see if you have uh, questions. So, uh, do not hesitate to, uh, to ask a uh, question in the Q uh, in the Q and A uh, box or uh, in the chat. Um, so, this first slide is about uh, why we need adaptive optics. Um, this, this is a very, very simple uh, sketch of uh, an optical system. Uh, so on the left, you have an object. Let's say it's a star because, you, you, as you may know, adaptive optics uh, uh, started in the field of uh, astronomy. Um, but this is just an example. The object can be, uh, can be uh, anything uh, uh, emitting light. Um, then you have the light uh, coming from this object, and it, it is uh, represented as a wavefront. Uh, as the star is very far, the wavefront is supposed to be perfectly, perfectly flat, uh, or at least a big, big sphere. Then you have some optical system. In this case, it is, uh, it is just a simple lens, uh, but of course, it can be a much more complex system, but uh, it is uh, easy to uh, represent it as a simple lens. And you have a sensor. In this case, we suppose that this is an imaging sensor, but of course it can be uh, anything else like uh, a fiber input, uh, feeding uh, light uh, into a spectrometer or, or any uh, uh, other device, such as a, um, a modem for telecommunication, for example. Uh, in this case, if we are using uh, some imaging sensors, the, the key is that it's easy to, uh, to estimate the quality of the signal by, by just displaying the image or on some computer. So um, in this setup, normally you are only limited in terms of resolution by the size, the size of the aperture uh, of this lens. Um, but in uh, real life, uh, very often you have some perturbation uh, this can be uh, anything um, modifying the index of refraction between the object and the optical system. And in fact, it can be even inside the optical system itself. For example, static aberration due to um, manufacturing um, imperfection inside the different components or alignment. Um, so in this case, imagine you just have a simple uh, bubble of uh, air at a different temperature. It will uh, change um, the index of refraction and uh, create a perturbation onto the wavefront. And uh, this is a good way to represent um, uh, things uh, for adaptive optics, is to uh, speak about wavefront and not only uh, the light uh, rays, because it's more easy to understand. So in this case, you see that uh, around this uh, bump, uh, the ray will uh, change because they are always perpendicular to the wavefront. And they will not, of course, focus on the same place, and you will have a blurred image. So this is where adaptive optics uh, can be used. Uh, so uh, the basics is to use what we call a wavefront corrector. 
in can be anything that will uh, change the wavefront and uh, make it flat again. And uh, if the, the wavefront is, is flat, then you will uh, have the, the corrected image, uh, sharp image again. So uh, it looks uh, very simple. Uh, the question is how do you implement this kind of uh, wavefront uh, correction? Uh, this is the next slide. Mm, so uh, the most commonly used by far uh, wavefront corrector is a deformable mirror. Uh, so in this simple uh, layout, you just put the deformable mirror uh, after the perturbation, um, and then the, you control this deformable mirror to produce a bump uh, that is a, that will cancel the bump onto the wavefront, and you see that after reflection, the wavefront is flat uh, again, and this will write the, the image. Um, so, of course, the question is, how do you control uh, this deformable mirror uh, to uh, cancel the perturbation? Um, but first, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at uh, how a deformable mirror is made, uh, just to have a rough idea of uh, how it works. Um, so, there are different kind of uh, technology. I will present uh, the ones that we are using uh, at, uh, at LPAO. Um, so, you see um, a picture of one of our products on the left, this is the most commonly used deformable mirror. And uh, on the right, you see uh, a cut of what is inside. So it is made of a flexible and very thin uh, reflective membrane. This is uh, where the light uh, will uh, be reflected, of course. And um, below this uh, thin membrane, there is a set of actuators. They are made of, um, they are similar to, to speaker or voice coils actuator, because they are made of small magnets, uh, number of them, uh, small coils, springs, and uh, they are attached to the um, surf reflective surface. So it means that uh, using a drive electronic and a computer co to control uh, everything, uh, you can send different level of current inside each coil, and this will push and pull each little rod and modif modify the, the shape of the optical surface. And this is how you produce bumps, uh, for example, to cancel for perturbation. So um, I will not go into uh, details about how do you uh, make or select deformable mirrors, but just a few words uh, about the important parameters. Of course, as any uh, optical component, uh, you first have to uh, uh, think about uh, the diameter depending on your uh, optical setup and uh, what kind of coating you need onto the mirror depending on the wavelengths and power levels that you are dealing with. Uh, this is so common to any uh, mirror, I would say. Uh, the key here is that you also have to uh, select the number of actuators. Uh, this is a bit like the number of pixels on a camera. Uh, if you have many, many actuators, uh, you will uh, create very uh, fine perturbation, but it may be a bit more difficult to control. And of course, there is a cost, uh, like in camera, if you have many, many pixels, uh, the cost is not the same. Uh, and um, you also have to uh, take into account the strokes. So, so this is the amplitude of deformations that you can you can produce, and the speed. And there is often a, a trade-off to make between the, these two parameters. And, and in this case, it will really depend on your applications. Uh, we'll see this uh, a bit later. Some applications require a lot of stroke, but are very, are very slow. And uh, other applications are really uh, need to focus on the speed of all the systems. Um, so how do you control a deformable mirror? Uh, the most simple way to do it is by just um, using a, a metric. Uh, so it's uh, an optimization process. Uh, here you find again the wavefront, the perturbation, the deformable mirror, a simple optical uh, system. And in this case, it will produce an image. And the idea is that you will um, change the shape of the deformable mirror. 
you can do it randomly, but of course there are many um, optimization algorithm to, uh, to, to, to do it more efficiently. Uh, and you will uh, try to converge to a shape that will uh, optimize, improve the metrics that you are measuring. So in this case, if you are doing an image, you, you, you can uh, use uh, the contrast. Uh, it is very simple to compute the contrast uh, metric from uh, any uh, image. And when the contrast metric will be uh, uh, at the top level, it means that the image will be will be sharp and uh, it will correspond to a perfect uh, correction of the perturbation. Um, so the, the good point of this uh, setup is that you can optimize really the metric that is important for your application. For example, you may, if you have a fiber, an optical fiber here, you don't have an image, but if you can measure the flux or the power level inside uh, your fiber, you will optimize directly what is important for you, uh, the, the amount of light that you can uh, inject into uh, your fiber. Um, but there is a drawback in, in some cases, is that uh, it takes uh, a bit of time to do this uh, optimization process. Uh, you may have to do many iterations, it's a bit slow. If the perturbation is moving very fast, then this kind of uh, setup may, may be too slow. So in this case, uh, you have a second method on the, on the right part. Um, so this is the case, for example, if the perturbation is atmospheric turbulence. Uh, we'll see some applications uh, later, but usually it's moving too fast uh, to do this kind of iteration process uh, fast enough. So for turbulence or other fast moving perturbation, what you are doing is um, instead of direct, directly using the metric, you uh, insert some kind of beam splitter uh, after the deformable mirror usually, and this will take a part of the light. You may, for example, use a wavelength that is not very useful for your application, um, but can be used to measure the perturbation and you will send it to what we call a wave front sensor. So uh, the idea is that it will um, do uh, a very uh, fast measurement and it will give you in one shot and in one iteration, the shape um, to be applied onto the deformable, deformable mirror. Um, so it's a bit more complex. Uh, you, uh, you, you need uh, this kind of sensor, and so the cost uh, may be uh, increased, but, but it is much faster. So I, I won't go into details about uh, all the kind of wavefront sensors that uh, are existing, but just to give you an idea, um, and this is the next slide. Um, I will introduce the basics of the most common wavefront sensor used in adaptive optics. Uh, it is called the Shack Hartmann sensor. Um, but you can also use uh, interferometers, for example, or uh, other kind of uh, wavefront sensors. So, how it is made? Um, basically, it is a camera, uh, usually a fast and sensitive camera. Uh, but the key is that in front of the imager, you will add a very specific optical uh, component, which is called a micro lens array. So um, this is an example of a product. And on the right side, you see a, a cut, a simplified cut of what is inside. So uh, you have the detector, uh, as in uh, any uh, camera, can be CCD or CMOS, for example. And uh, in front of it, you add this um, specific set of small lenses. And the idea is that uh, you see the wavefront here, it will uh, impact uh, each of the lens and produce one little spot, one little dot of light uh, per micro lens. So in the image, if everything is uh, perfectly aligned and the wavefront is completely flat, you will see a very um, uh, accurate pattern, uh, a grid of little dots on your uh, image. But of course, uh, if the wavefront is not flat, you see that uh, the spots will move everywhere because, uh, for example, on this part, you see that in front of this micro lens, the wavefront is a bit uh, tilted, so uh, the, the spot will move. And uh, the key is that you will uh, process this image using a, a computer, of course, and uh, you will track the little spots 
and the key is to um, measure the distance of each spot um, compared to its um, unperturbed um, position. And then uh, you will control the deformable mirror to uh, put each spot back at its uh, original position. Um, so um, this is for the way front sensing. Um, before we go to the real life uh, examples, uh, if you have any question, again, you can uh, just put them in the Q&A box that you will have on top on your Zoom uh, window uh, or in the chat and we'll uh, try to answer it uh, uh, as soon as possible. So um, let's go for a few examples. As we said, um, adaptive optics um, was uh, invented, let's say, uh, years ago uh, for astronomy and defense at the same time. Um, but defense applications are always a bit more secret. Uh, so what you see on this slide on the left, this is um, one of the largest telescopes in the world. This is a big telescope. And the mirror side is 10 meters, so it's really huge. And um, if you are looking at a, at a planet like uh, Saturn, for example, or Jupiter, uh, what you see uh, is an image that is not limited by the size of the telescope, but it is limited by the, by the turbulence. And you will see this kind of uh, completely blurred uh, image with only a few, uh, a few pixels. So um, the problem is the turbulence that, that is on top of the telescope and that will um, change the wavefront and completely um, degrade the image quality. So a solution, of course, is to put the telescope into space. Uh, so this is an example with Hubble uh, Space uh, Telescope. Uh, soon we'll have uh, another bigger web telescope. Um, and you see that as there is no turbulence, even if the telescope diameter is, is much smaller, you, you have a, a better image. Um, so uh, this is a solution, but of course, uh, sending a telescope into a space is very expensive and very uh, complex. So the other solution on Earth is to use adaptive optics, and these are real images from the Keck uh, telescope. Using adaptive optics, you can correct um, for the turbulence and recover the, the resolution of the telescope and get a better image than the Hubble um, Space Telescope. This is for astronomy, um, but there are many different applications now. An example is for uh, in microscopy, uh, many microscopy for uh, biology. So uh, on the left, what you see um, is a, a 3D uh, volume uh, of uh, a, a brain tissue. Um, what is important in this kind of study is to, is to go deeper and deeper to, to, to get more information about what is uh, uh, happening inside the tissue. And uh, when you go deeper, um, the tissue is a bit transparent. This is why you can do this. But of course, the light coming from this area, for example, uh, 200 microns below the surface, will travel across all the other cells and the, the, the wavefront coming from these points will be completely uh, uh, changed, and the image will be blurred. So the deeper you go, uh, the more the less sharp the image uh, will be. Um, this is real uh, images uh, taken with some um, Alpao um, deformable mirror. And it's taken uh, from the by the the, the Betzi, Eric Betzig, uh, team uh, in, uh, in the USA, and you see that uh, using adaptive optics you can recover uh, most of the image quality. And um, this is uh, with this kind of images that uh, Professor Betzig got this uh, Nobel Prize a few years ago. This is really an active uh, field because the difference is uh, is huge. Um, Another application uh, of uh, adaptive optics, uh, still in the, the medical uh, field, is for the imaging the, the eye and the retina in particular. So this is a simple cut of the, of the eye. So if you try to um, make images of the retina, which is in, on the back side of the, of the eye, of course, uh, you can cut the eye, but uh, it's not uh, easy on uh, living people. 
but you can also try to go through uh, the pupil of the, the eye and it uh, makes like microscopy, but um, with the eye. Um, of course, the eye does not have the optical quality of a microscope, even for somebody with a perfect uh, vision, because the brain is doing a lot of processing. And uh, so what you, you can see is this kind of image. You see the retina and some vessels uh, going uh, inside it. Um, but of course, what is important is, is to try to zoom and see the, the cells, um, the photoreceptors, to check for any disease or to follow some treatments that, the, that you may have. And the point is that if you zoom, again, these are really made from uh, our customers. Uh, you see really nothing um, because the optical quality of the eye is not good enough. And in this case, uh, using adaptive optics, you can really recover uh, uh, the quality of, of the image and uh, uh, the, the cones, the rods, the little cells and the retina will appear. Uh, and this is a really uh, impressive uh, result. This is done again um, with the same kind of deformable mirror from, uh, from Alpao. So um, now a completely different uh, application. So, uh, it's, for, it's more for um, uh, defense. Uh, as you know, uh, there are many uh, satellites and debris uh, uh, around uh, the Earth. And again, um, people trying to image and to uh, identify this kind of object uh, do it from Earth using telescopes. So it's similar uh, compared to uh, astronomy, but uh, these objects are very faint. Uh, they, they do not emit light like uh, stars and they are very small and fast. Uh, uh, they are moving very fast. So uh, uh, without adaptive optics, it's really impossible to see this kind of object. These are again uh, real images, and you see that uh, using adaptive optics, you can uh, recover most of the image quality. So uh, this is a real simulated object, and you can start to uh, guess what kind of object you have, and to identify the, what kind of satellite uh, you are imaging. Um, one point I, I won't go into the details, but you see in the picture of this uh, telescope that there is a laser beacon. Um, coming out of the, of the dome. This is due to the fact that the um, satellites do not emit enough light, usually. Uh, so you have to create some kind of reference to close the uh, adaptive optics loop, the feedback loop. And this is done using an artificial guide star made with this kind of uh, laser. So of course, this is a more advanced uh, system, but it is uh, really uh, famous now among uh, astronomy and uh, uh, different applications. Um, a, a very hot uh, topic uh, for adaptive optics uh, recently is uh, what is called uh, up, um, free space optical communication. Um, as you know, uh, there are now many communication satellites uh, on the Earth, for example, the SpaceX uh, constellation of satellites. Um, they are producing and trans or transmitting a, a very large amount of data. They are usually, usually uh, using uh, radio waves to transmit the data, but um, to transmit all this traffic down to the earth, then um, you will collect all the data and the bandwidth that you need is really uh, beyond what is possible with a radio wave. So then they are now switching to optical um, wavelengths uh, using uh, lasers. So it's a bit uh, uh, like uh, on Earth when you, you switch from uh, copper cables to uh, optical fiber. Uh, the key is that uh, the, as the wavelength is uh, shorter, you, you can transmit uh, more, more data. And now they are speaking about uh, terabytes per second of, uh, of data. Um, so in this simple sketch, um, you have a, a satellite, then you have a, what they call the downlink, when the satellite is sending data uh, down to the, the, the Earth, and the uplink, which is of course the, the opposite uh, link. And uh, the key is that uh, you still have this turbulence 
uh, layer. So usually it is close to the, the ground, well, at least compared to the, the satellite. And uh, for example, if you look at the, the red uh, laser, um, it will be very uh, sharp uh, in, the, in space. But as soon as you travel across the, the turbulence, uh, the light will be spread. And uh, the key is that at the end, uh, you need to, to um, inject this light coming from, uh, from a very fast satellite into a monomode fiber, which is like uh, 20 microns. So um, with the turbulence, uh, you will only get a very, very small uh, portion of the, of the light. And it is not enough to uh, get the, the, the data uh, bandwidth that you, that you need. So in, in this case, adaptive optics uh, is used to focus the light into the fiber and to inject uh, more signal. And you have a similar problem uh, for the uplink. Uh, so in this case, the idea is to compensate um, before the light is traveling uh, across the turbulence uh, to get again more signal uh, on the satellite because you cannot put a large telescope and large lighting aperture on the satellite because it's too, too large and too heavy uh, uh, for such a small uh, object. Um, Okay, yeah. so again, if you have some questions, you can ask them. So uh, before we go to the, the next uh, section. So if there is no, no, no question yet, I, I, I will go to the, um, the next slide. Um, so um, this is a very simple sketch we presented at the beginning. Uh, so you have the light, you have the wavefront, you have the perturbation, and uh, the idea is that you just put a deformable mirror in front of the perturbation of the, the beam, and it will work. Um, but you see here that, uh, of course, it will work only if all the light coming from uh, the bump onto the wavefront will arrive where the deformable mirror is. And uh, if you have no optical system, it may be possible, but in the real life, um, at some point, um, the, if you have this bump, for example, uh, if you remember the, or the, the ray of light are always traveling uh, perpendicular to the wavefront, uh, it will diverge. And um, in your optical system, uh, the light will just not uh, go to the correct uh, zone onto the deformable mirror. So uh, and it, it will just not work. You won't be able to correct for this part because the light will not go onto the deformable mirror. Um, so um, there is a solution for this, it's easy, is that you have to put some uh, lens or some telescope or some uh, other optical components to be sure that you will focus all the light coming from uh, one part of the wavefront and that it will go into the same area of the deformable mirror or, the, or any uh, correcting device uh, you, you may have. So it means optically that uh, one plane must be the optical conjugate of the other. Uh, it means that uh, it will be this plane will be the image of this one uh, through the, the optical uh, setup that is uh, in between. Um, so this is true for the um, wavefront uh, corrector. And uh, if you have a wavefront sensor, you, you must have the same kind of uh, rule uh, to be sure that this time you measure, you are measuring the, the correct area um, and you, the wavefront sensor will see all the deformable mirror uh, because uh, otherwise it, it cannot uh, uh, sense uh, the shape and uh, close the feedback loop. Um, Another common mistake, so this is more related to the how fast uh, the different components uh, must go uh, when you are doing adaptive optics. Uh, and it comes from, well, uh, a very specific feature of this kind of servo system, feedback system. As you know, uh, we to, to make, uh, to close the adaptive optics loops, the first step is to measure something. It can be a metric or directly the, the wavefront. 
And usually, uh, it takes some time to make this measurement because you have to integrate uh, the light. You have to uh, set an exposure time that is not zero. And then if you have an image, of course, you have to transfer the pixel. You have to uh, uh, compute the correction. And even if the a very fast uh, computer, the, the time is not zero. So it means that you will have a pure delay between the measurement and the first time that you can apply the correction. If you look at the curve below, in the, the black curve is the perturbation, the, the one that you want uh, to cancel. Um, the uh, red point uh, is where you, when you are uh, doing the measurement, and you have this delay, so uh, in green, uh, that uh, you, you, you will try to reduce it if you want to go fast, but it, it will never be zero. And so there is a delay between the fraction, which is the blue curve, and the black perturbation curve. Um, it means that it will, uh, you will get an, er uh, an error because uh, the AO correction is always running after the perturbation. This is a, a way to introduce uh, two different frequencies that you will have in your system. Um, the first frequency, uh, which is like more a frame rate, uh, is how fast you are doing the measurement. This is a sampling frequency. And you see that uh, on this simple uh, sketch that, uh, of course, you cannot, due to this delay, you cannot correct perturbations that are going as fast as the measurement frequency. Uh, and even with the commonly uh, used uh, factor two due to the Shannon uh, uh, rules. Um, so um, you have this, sampling frequency that is much faster than the correction or the perturbation frequency. Uh, and the, both frequencies should not be confused. And typically, can, the, you have a factor of 10. So it's very, uh, really significant. Uh, the measurement frequency may have to go 10 times faster than what you are trying to correct. Um, so this measurement frequency is used to um, uh, design the wavefront sensor, for example, to select the camera, to uh, design the software, select the computer speed that you, you, that you need. Um, but it is not uh, uh, as useful to select, for example, the deformable mirror, because the deformable mirror will not really uh, see uh, this frequency. It will just be a data uh, input. The actual frequency um, uh, at which the, the DM must uh, go is the perturbation frequency. So, the, so the, in this case, this is a blue curve. Uh, and again, it can be uh, 10 times slower than the uh, measurement or sampling frequency. So keep in mind that these two frequencies must be specified and um, uh, taken into account uh, separately. Um, so another um, common mistake, let's say, uh, well, it, it is actually uh, common to every uh, complex uh, system design. Um, at the end, the correction of the adaptive optic system will never be perfect. Um, so you have to um, make trade-off uh, and to make an error budget. You uh, and to reduce each contributor to the error budget um, below uh, your specification. And it means that uh, you, you need to identify each uh, error source and to balance uh, between each uh, contributor or source. So for example, um, some uh, residual error may come from uh, the optical components uh, or static aberration inside your, uh, your system. Um, and this is a way also to balance your budget. Because for, if you have an, an adaptive optics uh, system, if you have a deformable mirror, it may be completely useless uh, to design a very, very uh, fine optical setup and to select ex expensive optical components if you can correct uh, the aberration using the deformable mirror. So this is the first uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, another one is that, um, it's like for a camera, uh, if uh, with a camera you want to uh, image something that is, or to make a movie or something uh, moving very fast, uh, maybe the key parameter is not the number of pixels. Uh, what you need is a fast camera. 
And uh, most of the time, uh, to get a fast uh, camera, you need to reduce the number of pixels. This is exactly the same for deformable mirror. If your uh, perturbation is moving very fast, maybe selecting the deformable mirror with many, many actuators is not the best option. You may prefer to select a mirror, a deformable mirror with less actuators, but uh, a larger speed. It will also help because you, you on the computer side, you will have uh, uh, less computation to do, so it means that it will go uh, faster. Um, again, about the speed, um, um, at some point, um, now computers are very fast, so it may be easy to, to, to speed up the, the processing, but at some point you will be limited by the noise. Uh, if you don't have enough, enough light in each of your measurements, then your loop may run very fast, but it will just see noise. So again, you have to make a trade-off. Uh, between uh, the signal to noise ratio and the speed of your uh, adaptive optics loop because if you are only correcting noise very fast it won't help to to have uh, to recover the, the signal um, another uh, important thing is that um, uh, as for may, any optical system it's, it's usually uh, easier to produce a very good uh, optical quality on axis on the center of the field of view. Uh, this is the same for adaptive optics, uh, but in many applications, for example, in imaging applications, for, uh, of course, uh, you don't want to have a very sharp image on the center and a very blurred image on the, on the edges. So it means that you, you, may, you may need um, a different strategy of control on your adaptive optics instead of uh, optimizing the center of the field, which, e which is easy, you may need to, um, you may want to uh, produce an average quality over the full field of view. And uh, this is something to take into account for any imaging applications. So um, now that we reviewed a bit the, the principle, uh, where to start? Uh, when you are new to this field and when you have to demonstrate or evaluate the capability of adaptive optics for your specific application, your specific device or setup, uh, how can you start? Um, we, at Alpo, we think from experience that the best way is not to just start with uh, high performance component. Um, because unless you are an expert already, uh, uh, you really uh, can uh, spend a lot of time integrating everything and um, just making things uh, work together. So starting with a, even a, a very simple or very small demo setup uh, is very useful. So this is an example of setup that we can uh, provide and we recommend for, 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 let's, for beginners. Uh, so it's a very small optical breadboard. We only the necessary components. So you, you, you may recognize the deformable mirror on this side with the cables and drive electronics uh, uh, just on, on the side. We have a, um, a wavefront sensor, a Cartman wavefront sensor uh, on top, and the minimum uh, optical setup with a beam splitter, a light source, and a few lenses uh, to make uh, all these little tricks that we mentioned, for, exa for example, the optical conjugation and so on. So it will work uh, out of the box. Uh, of course, all the software, including uh, examples and documentation uh, are provided. And it means that you will start to see something, some results, uh, like uh, less than uh, one hour after uh, unpacking everything. And after this, uh, you can start to... Uh, the software or to dismount the components, integrate them into uh, your dedicated uh, breadboard, um, and really start to uh, tune the system to your application. But the key is that at any time you can come back to this little uh, uh, setup, and if you are to troubleshoot, uh, for example, a part of a piece of software that you design, and to or to, to check that uh, all components are working. Uh, uh, well, so uh, this is really, we think, the, the good way to, to start. 
Um, I think we're done with uh, the presentation. So again, if you have some uh, question, uh, this is uh, the time. Uh, you can, of course, uh, also send uh, your question by email or, to, or just call us. Uh, so we can help you uh, with adaptive optics in your application. Oh. So there is a question about creating the center. Um, yeah, so I see the point. Um, so the key is that uh, in many applications, you have field aberrations. So it just means that uh, because objects from different places uh, in, the, in, the, in the optical field of view do not travel across uh, the same aberrations, it can be turbulence or it can be uh, field aberration inside the optical setup. Uh, as, as they do not see the same perturbation, the deformable mirror can do only one perturbation. So it, it's impossible for, for it to correct for uh, all the field of view. Uh, so there is a trade-off uh, to be done. And I think that the question is more referring to uh, maybe the Fourier transform of uh, one uh, or the PSS, the point spread function uh, of one object. Um, so uh, it is in this case, this is not a really field aberration. It is a, a more imaging the point spread function of uh, of the object, but only one object. So it's a bit uh, it's a bit different. <laughs> okay, welcome. Yes, also as more comment or a question, but yeah, this is true. Okay, the, the question is about the current uh, limit for deformable mirrors. Uh, so it's true that there is a field called uh, extreme adaptive optics. Uh, so it's mainly for um, a very large telescope because the larger the telescope is, the more actuator you, uh, you will need to correct at the same level of quality. And in astrophysics, they are always pushing the limits uh, uh, every time. Um, and for, for some uh, space applications, uh, you also need a very large number of actuators. So currently at Alpao, uh, we have device uh, up to uh, 3,000 actuators. So it's uh, actually it's, uh, uh, 64 by 64 actuators uh, on a grid. And we are now working on a 128 uh, pair, 128 actuator deformable mirror. So it will uh, it will be ready for the European uh, extremely large telescope. We are working uh, with uh, ISO and this and this field, and uh, it will have uh, more than 12,000 actuators. And at the same time, uh, this kind of uh, application is to to correct. Um, most of the turbulence, um, for example, for um, to image some uh, planets uh, outside the, the solar system, and they, they have to, to go very fast at the same time. Uh, so uh, every parameter is pushed to the limit, large number of actuators, uh, very fast deformable mirrors, uh, so typically uh, two kilohertz of uh, mechanical uh, bandwidth, and the resolution also is uh, below uh, below one below 0.1 nanometer uh, to reach the, um, uh, the, the target qualities they need. Yes, and we 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 will soon deliver uh, this kind of deformable mirror for the Subaru uh, telescope. Um, 
And uh, okay, there is another question. So it's about uh, how we can help you to, uh, to set up uh, an adaptive optic system. So uh, as I said, uh, first, we, we, we may provide some uh, demo setup. Um, we can uh, provide some uh, training. Uh, it can be on site or uh, you, of course, uh, travel is, uh, is uh, still uh, complex uh, today due to the, to the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, but we can uh, sometimes do it uh, remotely. Uh, and of course, we can also provide pre-integrated system, custom systems uh, that will be closer to your application. Uh, so not only a demo system, but really a system that you can uh, plug into your uh, optical setup with the correct uh, pupil size, uh, deformable mirror, and so on, uh, to speed up the process uh, of uh, using adaptive optics. Um, so it looks like there is no more questions for now. Uh, so again, uh, thank you to, uh, for attending this webinar. Uh, there will be other webinars uh, with some uh, experts coming soon. So uh, keep, uh, uh, keep tuned and uh, we'll inform you as soon as we get the, the participant and, uh, and dates.